meetings with the, you know, the marketing teams are getting, getting together to plan a project or, you know, how is this product product going to get to market? And I'll sit in in the whole meeting just to understand what are the pressure points for the client. So the more knowledge you can have about your, the business that your client's running, the better you can support them. Um, And then I also think that just being available to the client is really important and accepting all the IMs, clients IM me all the time. And I respond to them because um, they need those quick responses and they want to feel, they want the attention, right? And know that you're there as their partner, um, not just buried in work um, and ignoring them. So I, we, I give a lot of attention to clients. I accept the IMs when we do video conference. I try to turn my video on as much as possible um, and really um, being there for the client. And then the last thing that I do frequently is I get the client to a place where they can own the work. So they come with a problem, but don't come to legal thinking that legal is now going to own this project and and get we'll get you the legal analysis, but I need the client to also be a partner in getting to the legal answer and to the legal solution. So don't just send the email off and then think that it's gonna get done. We set meetings, we'll have one-on-one, like a weekly meeting for a certain project so that we're sure we're checking in and it doesn't fall off of anyone's radar. And I think the clients really appreciate that because again, it's the availability it's making time on my calendar for their issues. So those are sort of my top tips for um, partnering, being a good business partner, being a good partner to the business. Thank you. And I think that's uh, from what both of you said, it's so important to understand the underlying business goals, uh, the underlying goal that uh, your client has, as well as being available. And I think that probably translates in, uh, into uh, what you may say in response to my next question, which is for all of us uh, who are uh, on the outside counsel side, uh, what um, sets apart a truly exceptional outside counsel and what does it mean to be a good partner, outside counsel partner for in-house counsel? Yeah, um, you know, I think a lot of it is is the same. And and for us, it's, you know, we use a, an array of different outside counsel, depending on the specialty and what we're working on. But one of the big things that I found is really useful um, across them all is just understanding what our objectives are and the big picture for our business. And then the 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 objectives that we're trying to meet for, for the partner or whatever transaction or issue it is that we're working on. And so it's really a struggle if, you know, at the beginning, and sometimes this is necessary, you know, if depending on if it's a complex transaction or whatever it may be to say, okay, let's download, let's make sure we're all on the same page about what we're trying to accomplish here. And then let's get to that end and not let, um, you know, little issues or, or um, unimportant issues get in the way. And I think for us, you know, what we've, we've been partners with our outside counsel for some of them way longer than, than I've even been with the NFLPA, which is running on 10 years now. Um, but, but a big piece of it is just trust and knowing that they get it and they're going to make a big deal over the things that are actually a big deal, right? And help guide us to that solution. And then, and that way, you know, we really want to be collaborative. A lot of times when we're working on these things, I'm, even though I'm the lawyer in house, I'm playing very much a business role when it comes to the outside counsel. Um, so it's, it's managing them to, to ensure that, um, you know, they're pushing on the issues that they need to, and I'm going to trust them to, to do that and advise us in that space. So that's huge for us. And then the the last thing I would say is um, what really helps them to stand out in my mind is obviously being available. We've had a couple of crazy past few years where I kid you not, we stole just about every holiday in in 2019 from our outside council because it just happened to be a deadline that, sorry, yes, it's the 4th of July, um, but they took it on and and they were great about it and they got us what we needed. And that's really important because just 
And I'm sure in so many businesses for folks on the phone, it's just, you know, we don't really control the schedule. Um, so that that's always really important. And just, you know, one of the points that I made earlier was anticipating what's to come and being really knowledgeable in the space to help us to detect issues that we may not have a pulse on uh, is always just a great quality. Yeah, and I think, I mean, everything Sophie just said, again, is is right on. on. And, and everything I said about how I'm a good partner to, or I try to be the best partner to the business, I think our outside firms need to do the same. So they need to come and be solution oriented. Give me the risk assessment, but then also give me your suggestions for how we can go to market and mitigate the risk. Um, and then, you know, really take the time to know the business. And that to me is huge for our outside partners is they know our business. And, and um, you know, Nestle is always acquiring and selling businesses. And, and when I have the firms um, and, and the people within the firms coming sending me an email, you know, I just saw you bought this business and, you know, congratulations, or this is really exciting. That means something to me because it means they're watching what we're doing um, and they're keeping themselves educated about our business, which is constantly changing. Um, so really know my business and um, anything that's public, like just be reading up on it and know what's going on. Um, and then I think also coming to us and providing your expertise, because we, as a lead in-house legal department, can't be experts in every area. You know, I head up the trademark function, but I can't know every nuance within trademark law. So having the outside counsel come and say, hey, there's this new case or this new issue that's coming up. And we do have firms that are great about doing that. And those are the ones I really value because I know I, I'll, when the issue comes to me, I know exactly who to call. And I just had one come up recently and it was perfect because they had sent me a few weeks ago, the, the firm had sent me something on this, on NFTs, this very new, new thing that's coming up. And uh, the firm had sent me some information on it. And then a few weeks later, a client came and said, we've got this, you know, we want to do something with these NFTs. And at least I knew what they were because I got that email from the, the outside lawyer. And then I was able to schedule a meeting with the outside lawyer and, and they'll educate us and let us know, you know, what we should be doing in the NFT space, um, which is a great example of just keep us, keep us updated on what's going on. Well, this is great advice and emphasizes the importance, I think, of spending time on the front end researching the business. Yeah. Um, and as far as NFTs are concerned, uh, I think they're <laughs> here to stay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in between people paying $69 million for artwork <laughs> and, uh, you know, NBA top shop, NFT uh, store, I think uh, nearly every brand, um, uh, I'm sure NFLPA will be <laughs> yeah. joining that at some point. So, um, so what are your, um, uh, I think uh, in terms of just learning about the business and staying connected, which both of you mentioned being available, uh, those aspects being so important in the partnerships with outside counsel, um, things have been uh, disrupted over the last year with the pandemic, uh, you know, things transitioning to virtual format, um, us not being able to meet with clients or, uh, uh, and, you know, as part of outside organization meetings like INTA, um, in person at least. Uh, what are your uh, tips for staying connected with clients and, uh, you know, other partners in the industry during the pandemic? Well, first, I just have to say, I the the nft overload is real and i am delighted <laughs> and refreshed to be on a panel that is not specifically on nfts even though they all somehow come back to it um look i i think for it's been tough i mean the pandemic um you know there there i guess there's silver linings for sure for our business you know so much of our client interface happens in person we're constantly on the road and from about january when we have a, a college all-star game through May, um, we're just, we have events after events, which are really partner facing. And, and we had such great time to be able to, 
you know, get together with them and have a drink or have a meal and yes, talk about work and get things done, but also just establish those personal relationships. And the pandemic has completely flipped that on its head. I mean, we've all been grounded as I'm sure many others have been. So, you know, um, I don't, I haven't found a way to fully make up for that. Um, but there's certainly a lot more face-to-face, you know, off-season calls that we otherwise wouldn't have had with, with partners, which, has, has their pros and cons. Um, you know, a a tip that I've found that has, has been useful in some ways is to try to find times to maybe connect with clients or business partners, um, over zoom that may be late, you know, schedule it where let's talk about this, but let's also have a cocktail. And it's, it's not quite the same as the in-person thing, but at least you, you know, you're more inclined to, actually catch up and establish, um, the personal relationship there. And then the other thing I'd say, which might be a little counterintuitive is which I love when, when folks come to me with it is offering a phone call or just calling instead of setting up a zoom. Um, I think, you know, everyone has fatigue and it's, you know, while you're like, yeah, I really should connect with this client. It's been a long time since I've have talked to them, but do I really want to get on another zoom to do it? And a lot of times the answer is no. And so if it's, yeah, I can take a call and walk around the block while I'm doing it. I, I welcome that all the time. I like that. I haven't done that yet. I haven't walked around the block on calls, but that's a good idea. Um, so Luckily, fortunately, when the pandemic hit, Nestle was very prepared with the IT infrastructure. Um, and we just converted over to from in-person meetings that we would normally do in our office, just directly to video teams meetings. Um, and I think for most of the meetings, it's optional if you turn your camera on or not. And I think everybody decides, you know, if they need to for that meeting. I try to, when I'm in client meetings, um, turn my camera on. And, and I think one of the, the nice things with these team meetings is we're not rushing around so much. And before with our in-person meetings, we would have to, you know, you would have meetings back to back and you'd have to run around to different rooms in the building, different conference rooms and different floors. And so you don't have that anymore. So people are showing up on time, which gives you a few minutes usually the first five minutes of the meeting, or you can catch up and have some small talk. And so I try to do that, not go straight into what, you know, what's on the agenda, but let's all just, you know, how's everything going? And I think the, the, the employees at Nestle have been really good about sort of taking a breath and um, joining the calls and, and being a little more relaxed and not as I've got to rush to the next meeting. Um, so that's been, I think, really nice. Um, so one of my tips is, you know, turn your camera on and, and have um, face to face with the clients, because I think it's really helpful. And then take the time to have some small talk, which is super important. And then we have a lot of virtual employee functions, whether it's legal department sponsored um, or company sponsored, and I attend those. And, and those are really um, great to you know, see what's going on one with the business, but then also to connect with your colleagues um, who are also the clients. Uh, And I think also things like this, this summit is fantastic um, and gives an opportunity not necessarily to be connecting with clients, but to be connecting with others in the industry. So, um, you know, we just have to continue doing these virtual events. Thank you. And uh, we're very fortunate to have you and everyone in the audience. Um, and I have to agree. I try to turn on my camera uh, as much as possible, although it can be, uh, you know, with my workout schedule now being in the middle of the work day, sometimes <laughs> turn on my camera and I say, sorry, that's not, you know, um, uh, but, you know, it's good to see people face to face. That said, it's so as Sophie mentioned, uh, sometimes jumping on the phone um, and being able to walk around um, is, but still stay connected is also a good way uh, because I think everyone has been planted in their chairs for the past year, uh, you know, on continuous Zoom and and, and Teams meetings. So for our uh, more junior uh, members uh, in the audience, uh, both in-house and outside counsel, how, what are your tips, if any, on how to grow your network um, 
uh, during the pandemic, or I guess during this more new normal where there is a lot less in-person interaction um, uh, than it used to be? I mean, I can go first on that one. I think importantly, jump in and and ask your um, your clients to have meetings with you or to have um, you know to offer up a CLE or and it doesn't have to be a CLE for credit, which I know is it can be complicated to put together. But you know, there's some issue and uh, uh, NFTs are an example. But just offer to have a discussion with your client about it. And I think, um, you know, in preparation, I, I talked with Anna about this, but for me, if, if an associate, someone junior in the firm comes and says, you know, I've done some research on this issue. I would love to just have a discussion about with your team about it. And can we set up some, set up some time? And then, um, and I won't bill you, right? Maybe it's a half an hour and it's not billed, I'm going to say yes. And so now you're coming to me and, you know, we're having some face-to-face -face time. The rest of my team is seeing you and meeting with you and we're learning something. And I think that's a really easy way to um, develop relationships with clients. And I, I welcome that um, and, and would love it if more junior associates did that. So I, I encourage partners to, to um, encourage the associates to reach out to clients and, and just give some training information. Um, and I just also think sessions like this one that we're having right now are invaluable. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on one thing. I think Kristen nailed it. Um, you know, the other thing that I would um, add is it's more of a, um, a soft effort, but, but spending time to write, you know, whether it's thought leadership pieces or publications and it's, you know, on specialty areas, such as some of the one, you know, what Krista mentioned in terms of hosting a CLE or a meeting, you know, I think putting stuff out on whether it be LinkedIn or various different channels can go a long way to just get your name and subject matter expertise known uh, among the community or whatever network you're trying to reach. And, you know, um, it, it doesn't necessarily encourage face to face, but maybe it will. Maybe people reach out as a re as a result of that and, um, you know, can be a way to to really anchor yourself into different areas. Oh, this is super helpful. Thank you both. And I think it emphasizes the importance of investing um, into uh, partnerships, investing in yourself mm -hmm. in terms of keeping up to date with ongoing trends in the industry. Um, it's very easy, especially when you're starting out to be buried in work or, or a particular case or a litigation. Uh, but I think it's important and goes a long way uh, based on what both of you are saying to keep writing, uh, reaching out, uh, staying up to date with the trends and really uh, having a value proposition for the clients um, and, and, and making yourself available. Um, which uh, goes to the next topic that we thought we would cover today is building your brand externally and internally, your professional brand, your personal brand. Um, as a trademark lawyer, I can go on and on about talking, talking about the importance and power of a brand. Um, and uh, for, um, for all of us, it's imperative uh, to you know, build a strong internal brand within your organization but also an external brand um, and continuously think of what your brand is, um, how you want people um, uh, to perceive you, what is your perceived expertise within and outside of the organization, and how do you leverage uh, partnerships with clients, outside professional organizations, uh, law school friends, um, or other contexts in the industry to help uh, build and grow your brand internally and externally. Um, so uh, uh, Chris and Sophie, uh, for in-house attorneys, especially junior in-house lawyers in the audience, what are your tips for defining and building uh, your brand uh, within, uh, your, uh, within uh, their respective organizations? Yeah, Anna, um, you know, I think part of it depends a little bit on the your office culture and environment and, you know, how big of a team that you have. 
I can speak to my experience. Um, the NFLPA is pretty lean. I mean, we have, I want to say probably about 130 staff all in and, um, the legal team is, is 10 lawyers. We have a few recovered lawyers on staff as well that are now in different positions, but, you know, in that, I can tell you what worked for me really early on was just putting in the time and becoming, you know, I I'm very much a generalist, um, as you know, many are in in-house roles. You kind of have to know enough about a bunch of different areas and what you don't know, you need to go and figure out. And a lot of it, um, is you putting in the work to go and find answers, even when you don't have them. And the more that you do that, it's just, you know, people, and especially in my business, that they, they really come to trust you. They know, oh, I don't even know who to go to for this answer, but because of my experience working with Sophie or whomever, um, I know that she's going to help me get to the solution. Um, and it, it's, it goes back a little bit to what we talked about earlier with the bottlenecks. It's not going to be well, if I go to a lawyer on this, I'm probably going to get a no, um, but it's okay. Here's a problem or here's a new area that we've never even addressed before. We've, we've had a lot of these in the past years, whether it be, you know, the emergence of sports betting and how's that going to impact our business to NFTs to a, having a pro season in a pandemic. I mean, you name it, but just the willingness to, to solve problems and find solutions and present those has really been effective for me. And, and I think as you do that, you really carve yourself out as being um, critical to the, to the business, um, which is just good, I think, for, for internal growth and, and, you know, longevity. If you want to stay in the business that you're in, you, you, you know, you're almost, um, you're just critical. They need you. Um, and, and the other thing that I would say too, is, um, that really worked for me and just my approach and in, in establishing that trust is knowing my audience and delivering whatever it is that I'm trying my message to that audience specifically. If I'm talking to, you know, one of our executives who I know is an ex-lawyer, I'm going to talk to them in that sort of way versus someone who has, you know, no framework whatsoever is really looking at it through a business or, or narrow lens and catering the message to that. And it just, I think from a practical standpoint, really helps to establish that trust, which um, for me has been really helpful in brand building. I'm trying to get off mute. So totally echo everything that Sophie just said and, and just I'll just build on that rather than repeating because because I think those points are invaluable for building your brand. Um, but I, I think that um, for what I've done, I've been with Nestle for 14 years now. And for what I've tried to do at Nestle to build my brand is to um, be the lawyer that the clients can come to and, and, and the process is easy. Um, and, and it's not convoluted and it's not confusing to them. So, you know, in, in trademarks, most a big chunk of what we do is um, you know intake of the issue, so clearance, right? So I set up really great and um, clear ways of working and processes for clearance, for licensing, even for enforcement and and the intake process. So the client knows where to go and how to you know deliver the information. So then, and this is also part of building the brand, we can act quickly on it and get back to them fast. Um, and I think that just, you know, really thinking about what do you want your, and for me, it's not just what do I want my brand to be, but what do I want my functions brand to be? So I have a small team and what do I want the brand of that team to be and developing that brand with the tools and the resources that are available to the client um, so that they know exactly where to go, exactly how to interact with us. Nothing is scary. Um, and, and it all just flows really well and they're thankful and, and they come back again and again. Um, so that's worked really well, setting up the right tools and resources for the business to use. Um, another area where I've had to sort of brand myself over the last few years is with licensing. And at Nestle, we didn't have very much licensing going on about five or six years ago. And we had some change happening within the organization where we moved from 
four years ago, we moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. So we lost some people within the legal department. So I volunteered to take on the licensing responsibilities. Um, and from that, I've built that brand as well, which is a little bit separate from the trademark function because there's a lot more involved in licensing than just the trademarks. Um, but you know, the, I, I've become and built this um, area of expertise within the organization that the business people from all over different functions, different divisions and different campuses will come and say, I've heard actually even someone from China recently, Nestle China came and said, I've heard, you know, a lot about licensing within the organization. Can you help? So that's a brand that I've built is as, as the licensing um, expert within the organization. And it really that in that sense, it was just volunteering and, and getting in and really learning an area and putting it together again with tools and resources. Can I just add one thing to that? Because Krista, I think you make a great point and I've seen that be really effective internally, but also brand building externally too. You know, for in our, in my industry, um, there, I, I've seen at least three come to mind, people who, lawyers who work at, you know, firms and don't really have, aren't specialized in certain topics, but they really just got in early on and did just that. Um, you know, like sports betting is a perfect example where they, they went and spoke on every panel and published thought pieces and really establish themselves as an expert in, you know, sports betting or whatever it may be, which is funny because you look at these different panels and you're like, gosh, I see this person's name on every single one of them. And then you dig a little bit deeper and you realize they don't even really work in this space. They're just interested in it and took the extra step to establish themselves as an expert. And then who knows where that can really take your brand and your profession if, if you're able to do it successfully. But I've, I've certainly seen it in a number of different spaces work really well for people in recent years. Yeah. And I think it's great if you authentically enjoy and are interested in the subject area, right? Then it's going to come through and show. So find something that you really are passionate about. Oh, this is a really great advice. And um, following up on that in terms of it, it building your brand externally or your team's brand externally. Uh, there are so many initiatives and organizations, events going on. Uh, how do you allocate your resources and time wisely so you advance your goals um, and there is no you know, information and in these days Zoom overload? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Um, that can happen. I get, I have information overload because I get emails all day long about, you know, from salespeople wanting to tell me about some, something. And, um, I, I think I, I really focus on some core places to get the information. I think law 360 is fantastic. Um, I, I enjoy WTR and then whatever into puts out, I enjoy reading. Um, so those would be my three core places to get information um, interestingly, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, someone from WTR reached out to me about, um, about interviewing me for an article they were writing. And so I, you know, gave them a few talking points and have been quoted in the article, but saying yes to that opportunity has the WTR now coming back to me on a very regular basis, wanting me to give them, you know, to interview me and talk about whatever, the subject matter is for the article they're writing. Um, and that's been a really good opportunity just to sort of get out there externally, um, you know, build that brand externally by being a resource for the WTR. Um, and I've really appreciated that. And that was really just me getting a solicitation and saying yes. Usually I would say no. <laughs> and, and I, for whatever reason, um, decided to say yes that day. So that's been um, really helpful. And then just with getting um, more information, I rely on outside counsel. You know, Anna, I'm relying on you. <laughs> Keep me updated. We're here. And we have a suggestion uh, to the, I have a suggestion to marketing for next Finnegan Forward. We'll have to do um, 
NFTs, like Finnegan Ford NFT. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you some other topics too. <laughs> yeah, and for uh, the patent, my patent colleagues in the audience, WTR is a world trademark review. It's a publication that is, uh, you know, very prominent and in the International Trademark uh, Association. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, getting um, to know and getting involved with the key organizations and eliminating noise in your space. Uh, exactly. Sophie, uh, do you agree? You're you're in a different, well, related but different as uh, space. So it would be great to hear uh, your thoughts and where you get the information and how you sort of filter on uh, how to spend your resources in terms of the external involvement. Yeah, I, I mean, I do a lot of the same as Krista. A lot of old-fashioned, just reading everything, news scraping, Google alerts are really effective for me because um, I can really drill down on what topics I'm interested in. One, a lot of the folks um, at, at the NFLPA and I assume and a lot of other companies as well um, are just news hungry. I mean, we're trying to digest and get as much as we can so that if we're, you know, if we're on with a partner, we know that they just did a major launch or bought a new company or something. And we have that information. But one of the things that we've done is pool our resources internally at the NFLPA. And so we know that we're all out there scrubbing all of the news and, and sports and industry uh, sources. And so we'll have internal, what we call media clips that they'll send around and they'll scrub the top, top news of the day. And so you can get your quick hit information there. And then in my team, we really encourage, um, share what you're reading, right? If you see something out there that's really interesting, um, just, just drop a note. We read a lot of the same publication. So we've probably seen it, but sometimes we don't, um, cause you can really go down a rabbit hole sometimes. And, you know, we, that also extends to some of our external partners too, where, especially in the IP space, um, you know, IP is just one part of what we do at the NFL PA, but I really lean on my, my partners that that's what they do. They are the brand protection specialists for their company. And so they just have way more news access and are paying attention a lot closer than I am. And so well, I'll, I'll do catch up calls with them and, Hey, what are you hearing? What are you seeing on this topic? And that's a really, really useful source of information for me. Great. And um, this is all very helpful. And I personally have uh, learned so much. Uh, and that brings me to the last segment of our um, uh, session or masterclass today, which is um, developing partnerships uh, and how does diversity and inclusion comes into the equation. Um, luckily and fortunately for our industry, diversity and inclusion has been at the forefront of uh, both, um, you know, uh, law firms and uh, in-house agenda. Um, and I, I have really seen a lot more interest from multiple clients and, you know, getting um, annual updates or surveys on who's working on their teams, how many diverse associates we have, uh, what um, does our management look like in terms of the uh, diversity. And I'm proud that, you know, 58% of uh, the management at Finnegan is diverse and we're trying to expand the pipeline. Um, a selfishly, a couple of initiatives for Finnegan I wanted to mention to the whole audience um, and in case, uh, you know, both in-house counsel and my Finnegan colleagues in attendance are interested, please reach out um, with questions. Um, we um, have an, uh, established recently the Finnegan Corporate 1L Diversity Summer Associate Partnership, uh, which is a usually a nine to 10 uh, week program for diverse uh, 1L uh, students, law students. And they spend about five, six weeks uh, with Finnegan uh, in about three, four weeks with a corporate sponsor. Uh, we're set for this year, but we're gonna do it again next year. This year, participants include Georgia Pacific, uh, R uh, RTX, uh, Intuitive, and Finnegan essentially, we pay the full summer salary for the full 10 week program, but the person, the diverse 1L student gets the opportunity to see um, and get, gain experience both at the law firm and, and with a corporate sponsor. Um, and we launched at the end of last year also the mid-level DNI partnership uh, program, uh, where we uh, partner um, high-performing diverse associates with a 
a client mentor for one year and we offer 360 mentorship in return. Uh, we've been uh, doing that very successfully with our client Unilever, who uh, you know they have their GC of uh, global privacy work with uh, two of our mid-level associates um, meeting every month um, in the mentorship sessions. Um, so I encourage um, if anyone is interested to reach out to me and it's been a great way not only to um, help and mentor uh, diverse talent, junior talent at the firm, but uh, also I think for uh, our in-house partners to, uh, to mentor and get to know each other and talk about their diverse, uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives at, at their organizations. Uh, but also connect on substantive issues and, and develop the network. So um, with that, um, uh, Chris and Sophie, I know uh, both NFLPA and Nestle are very active in the space as well. Um, and uh, I guess the first question is, do your organizations look at the uh, DNI metrics for new and existing outside counsel or other partners, vendors? And uh, what are some of the criteria that you evaluate uh, to the extent you can share with the audience today? So I can say um, just briefly that we do look at that and that um, the information is loaded into a system that we have. Um, and there's a team within our legal department that is reviewing that. Um, I'm not involved, so I don't have a lot of details and I don't have the criteria, unfortunately. Um, but just on a more, you know, a, just for what I do in my practice area, we um, definitely, when we're making decisions on how to staff a matter, we are looking for the diversity, both the diversity and thought, you know, just to, to bring different thinking. Um, and we, uh, you know, we also are looking to have more females involved in the projects, you know, and or at least more balanced um, than it has been in the past. And I think that's changed a lot. And I think, you know, the Finnegan team has brought a lot of that to our, our trademark work, which has been great. Um, but that's, I mean, as far as, you know, we do, we do get the information and it is being reviewed, but I don't have, unfortunately, details on, on what the criteria is. For us, um, you know, we, I, I, one of the things that the NFLPA is, has as, as long as I've been there, been pretty proud of is just how diverse of a workforce we have. Um, and it's probably has a lot to do with our membership being a very diverse population of people. And so, um, you know, it's certainly something that we value in our business partners. And um, we've, you know, as we look to do, especially new business transactions, I can tell you that from a, um, you know, a DNI standpoint, just d diversity in, in the, in the leadership of those companies and um, product uh, is certainly something that we look at and, and we value a lot. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I can say, and just this isn't really, I don't think this really goes to your question, but it's just um, something that I've been appreciative in my experience with the NFLPA, at least, and in sports, is it's not always been very diverse. I mean, it's, you know, that you hear the good old boys club. And, and I think that's changed a lot. And it's, it's nice to see that, you know, just women in, in leadership positions and diversity at the top in terms of founders, um, board makeup, um, and just, just folks in leadership positions in general. That's, that's great to hear. Um, and, um, and, and Krista, I'm, very proud to hear about the trademark team at Finnegan. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We're working on the gender balance, which brings me to my next question. Uh, I know you developed, Krista, in a former co-leader of the Nestle Arlington Campus Gender Balance Network. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that initiative? I think, I think that is very interesting, especially for all of those in the DC, Northern Virginia area in the, in the office. Yeah, just, I just wanted, we have a time check. Are we, are we wrapping up in a few minutes? We're wrapping up. I'll, we're okay, all, so I'll go, I'll go really quick. So um, when we moved from the West Coast to the East Coast to Arlington, Virginia, um, Nestle formed employee, employee resource groups, so ERGs. 
um, in, in different areas. And one of them was gender balance. I literally just volunteered. I was new to Arlington and I volunteered to help out with the ERGs, not necessarily any particular one. Um, but I was uh, asked in the first meeting, you know, would you, do you want to take on gender balance? And I said, absolutely. So um, myself, and then, and this is another way that I kind of partner with the business or get to know the business, build my relationships as myself. And then two salespeople, two female salespeople, the three of us created this gender balance network within our Arlington office, which was for the purpose of um, promoting women within the organization. And the goal was to bring content um, and situations to the female employees so that they could, um, you know, have better visibility within the organization and promotion opportunities. Um, so we set that up and drove that and it has over the four years now really grown. Um, I'm now the president of the Gender Balance Network for the US, which is across, we have three campuses, Cleveland and Seattle and Arlington. So now we're bringing the three campuses together, but it's really all about you know, giving opportunities to women in the organization that they wouldn't other, otherwise have. And so we look for, you know, what can we bring to our gender balance network um, to help them along in their career? That's fantastic. And uh, it's always good to know what our uh, clients, what our contacts are doing in their respective organizations. And I think for all of us to take note uh, and think of how we can collectively move the needle uh, and make uh, the legal profession a more inclusive uh, place for everybody. Uh, with that, I know we're almost out of time and I really want to thank both of you for taking the time uh, for providing such invaluable advice um, and tips um, and a very uh, you know inspiring to hear everything that you're doing about your career paths. Um, so thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Sophie. Yes, thanks both. It's been great. Thank you, Krista, Sophie, and Anna. Um, Sophie, it was really insightful hearing about you know, the importance of tailoring dialogues and trust building as a vehicle for about the importance of staying up to date with trends and making the tools and resources easy is, is really valuable. Um, and of course, I too find that regular phone call can be refreshing break when you need to sleep or do business and share a lot of our time. We can also emphasize a lot. So thank you both for highlighting that. Um, and thank you, Anna, for facilitating such an insightful discussion. We are going to take a quick break now until for five Stern when we convene for a social event in the morning for the Pi Con virtual dinner and social. Hope to see you all back in four hours. Thanks, everyone.